have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote this morning, uh, Professor Joanna Westbrook. Um, I'm delighted that you're able to come and join us here um, face to face to deliver this presentation. So her presentation is on how information technology can support improved services and outcomes in aged care. Uh, well, delighted to be here in this very unusual sort of keynote presentation. Um, it has brought back memories of sort of doing exams, seeing everybody lined up in their little desks. Um, and also it sort of was a bit frightening sort of suddenly saying, oh my God, a one hour keynote. I mean, we're all sort of tuned to 20 minute Zoom presentations. How is anybody going to survive an hour keynote? Because, you know, it's all right for you guys at home because you're probably multitasking at the moment. Um, but for everyone captured here, <laughs> you can't do that. So I will hope that we'll try and make it a bit interactive um, given the constraints that we're operating under. So um, I'm from the Australian Institute of Health uh, Innovation at Macquarie University, and most of you will be familiar with the Institute, I hope. Um, it's made up of three research centres. Uh, and there you can see my colleagues who are the directors. Um, Jeffrey Braithwaite is the director of the Institute overall, and he's also the director for the Centre for Health Care Resilience and Implementation Science. Um, Enrico Coyera is the Director of the Centre for Health Informatics and I'm the Director of the Centre for Health Systems and Safety Research. And to make life easy, we call them Kai, Chaser and Chris. That's the way we refer to them. Um, but we're all physically located together and our teams are interspersed. Uh, and really what we do is we tackling research around how do we deliver better healthcare services. So we have very multidisciplinary team. We have people who are clinical backgrounds, social science backgrounds, engineering and IT backgrounds, and we're all working together to solve problems in the health system. Now, within my centre, we have a particular research stream which is focused on aged and community care, and they call themselves the ACER team. Uh, and really today, it's my great fortune to be able to report a lot of the research which has been led by this you know, highly talented um, group of people. Unfortunately, none of them are here to ask, answer the uh, tough questions. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, it would be nice to get a bit of interaction going. So my first question was introduce yourself to your neighbour if you can reach them. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I think most of you probably in the audience here know each other. I think you're probably working closely together. Um, but I thought it was also interesting to think about when you think about aged care, what's the first word that seems to come into your mind? I don't know, sort of anybody wants to shout out? <laughs> I saw. Okay, so, so lots of um, words come to mind. So what I thought we'd also do is find out a little bit about how much this audience knows about aged care. So I thought we would do a quiz. So um, because we've got plenty of time, I'd ask you to bring out your mobile phones uh, and you need to log on to kahoot.it. Okay, you don't have to use your real names, you can use a pseudonym, that's fine. So we have four players. I think you could probably join online as well for those in the ether. But so I've got one, two, three, four. Wait until everybody's on board. There must be some people online. Well done. <laughs> ah, yes, we can turn these up. Excellent, just this uh, slightly annoying. <laughs> okay, so I think we've probably got... We've got peers and peers too. Oh, easy to put it straight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let's let's start and see how we go with the first question. Okay, there is timing. You get more points the faster your response. By the way, so in 2018, 2019, how much uh, was the government spend on aged care in Australia? Options are 5 billion, 15 billion, 20 billion, or 10 billion. We've got six seconds left. <laughs> okay, so it's actually a 20 billion. Uh, so people are generally underestimating the amount that we're spending on aged care. Right, next. 
Oh, who's in the lead? Olivia. Yes, Olivia. Okay, here's a poll. Do you have a close relative or friend living in a residential aged care facility or home? Okay, that's really quite low. Maybe it's a reflection of the general age of the audience. Okay, next question. What's the average age of people admitted to a residential aged care home in Australia? 65, 85, 90 or 75? 10 seconds left. Mm. Oh, so pretty, pretty good at this. It is 85, slightly higher for women than for men because they stay around looking after the men. <laughs> okay, next question. Oh, who's up the front? Joyce, Joyce. Oh. <laughs> okay, what proportion of aged care residents take 10 or me more medications daily? 40%, 5%, 25% or 70%? Yeah, well done. Yep, it is 40%. Gosh, 70 people think this. Yep, 70%. Who is at the top? Braden. Okay. What proportion of antibiotic prescriptions in residential aged care are estimated to be um, appropriate? That is consistent with guidelines. 55%, 70%, 20%, 80%? Ah, well done, it's only about 20% of antibiotic prescriptions are thought to be consistent with guidelines. This is there. <laughs> okay, getting close to the end. Which of the following are mandatory quality indicators that all residential aged care facilities have to report to the government? Is it the quality of life of residents, pressure injuries, use of antipsychotics, or all of the above? Actually, pressure injuries is the only mandatory indicator out of those at the moment. Okay. Joyce, Joyce has an inside run on some of this information. Uh, okay, so seven of eight. How many older Australians have been approved to receive, receive home care services but are awaiting an available package? So they've been assessed, but they're waiting to actually receive any services. Yeah, very good. It's over 120,000 people. And then we saw that fantastic item in the budget, which increased it by 2,300 places. Okay, and the final question. How confident are you that the current aged care system will deliver the care you might need in the future? Very confident, somewhat confident, not at all confident. I try not to think about it. Yep. So I think that's a reflection of, you know, we're clearly aware that there are major challenges with our aged care system. So thank you very much for just warming up to that. Now I'm going to try another feat and get back to my slide presentation. Hopefully it will work. Are we back? Excellent. All right. Is that the right? Wow, that. Great. Yep. Oh. Uh, 
That's not. Okay. So, um, you know, the aged care sector, as we've heard, with the, you'll all be aware of the Royal Commission, it's under increasing pressure, lots of deficiencies in care identified. But one of the major things is that's come out of the Royal Commission is that there really is very little data to let us know generally what is going on and to monitoring what is happening. Um, as I mentioned, there's, you know, really few indicators that are required to be reported by aged care providers. So, Part of the call from the Commission is, look, these providers need to be much more accountable. Families want to know what's going on. And unless we have some data about what's happening, how can we possibly target any improvements? But we also know that there is just an enormous amount of information that is collected in residential aged care. For those of you who've been in there, it is incredibly bureaucratic. They have to document absolutely everything. So it's not like they're, not, they're drowning in data, um, but <clears throat> they really have very little information. So our research interest is really trying to say, how can we convert all this data that is in the system and provide a better idea about what is actually happening? And this is particularly as aged care providers are starting to introduce electronic health record systems, electronic health records. And so this information is actually being captured electronically, but once it gets into the system, no one's using it. Um, for any of these sort of quality improvement activities. And this is what we're interested in doing. So currently there are three mandatory national quality indicators for aged care, pressure injuries, unplanned weight loss, and the use of chemical restraints. And then next year, it is planned that they will add two more, uh, one around medication. So that's the proportion of residents that are on polypharmacy and antipsychotics and major injuries and falls. So it's still quite a small number of indicators. But for these to actually be meaningful, they have to be um, represent, they have to be accurate, and they have to be calculated in a way that people trust them and think that they can um, use them to take action. And in addition to that, they can't be just another data collection activity because the sector is already drowning and they have enormous staff shortages. So we are really looking at practical ways of supporting them. So I wanted to give you just some examples of some of the work we've done around pressure injuries. So pressure injuries cause enormous amounts of pain and distress. If they're not treated early, they can go on and they take, can take a long time to heal. So the Commonwealth implemented a pressure injury indicator and they promptly produced a nice paper audit form for residential aged care facilities to complete. And four times a year, they have to go around and review every single resident, and then they fill out this piece of paper, which tells them how, you know, how many uh, pressure injuries each resident had and what stage it was at. And then they have this little column of comments. So you can just imagine how that, when that gets sent off to the Commonwealth, will be analyzed, free text. Uh, and they've actually moved on to now there is an Excel spreadsheet where they could add this um, data. And they do this four times a year and then they send the information off and then a little while later, they will get a report back on their numbers. So, you know, we looked at this situation and said, well, actually, for a lot of residential aged care providers, they have all this information currently in their clinical information systems because they are managing these residents with injuries every single day. So for heaven's sake, surely we should be able to extract that information from these systems and prevent them from having to do, so for this provider that had 70 homes, they'd have to do 280 audits every year to provide this information to the Commonwealth. So we said, let's do proof of concept that we can actually do this. So we joined with this provider, we extracted the information from their clinical information systems. And it wasn't completely easy um, because what happens with information systems is that if no one ever uses the data in them, often some of the quality of the data that goes in isn't fantastic. But what we were able to show is that we could pull out and show that nearly 4,000 pressure injuries occurred over two years. 28% of all their residents had experienced at least one. The median was two. Incident density was 1.3 per thousand resident days. But we could go beyond that and actually say, well, where on the body are they actually occurring? Where should you perhaps be more concerned about? And so here you can see the proportion of pressure injuries by physical location. We could also tell them who was actually reporting them. 
and we could then provide them with a report for every single facility on a month-by-month -month basis. So they could actually see what was happening at each of their different facilities. And you can see from this graph that there were very different patterns of pressure injury rates for the different um, facilities that they were running. And so it starts to give you information where you could possibly start thinking about, is there somewhere where we should be concerned about? We can then apply a, you know, a slightly more sophisticated um, stats to this data and take into account the fact that you need to adjust these data according to your resident profiles. So if you're running a facility that has, you know, the average age is 95, you have a high proportion of patients who have diabetes, you would expect to have a much higher rate of pressure injuries than if you have a facility where the average age is 75 and everybody is highly mobile. And so you need to adjust for those factors. And here is just an example of how we uh, applied some adjustment for the case mix of residents. And once again, as a basis to try to identify which facilities, so each dot represents a facility here, perhaps they, um, the provider might want to investigate. At a national level, there is no adjustment being taken care of. They're just raw data. And so you can start to see that the providers are not taking a great deal of notice of these indicators because they realise they're not that meaningful for them. And they think also that a lot of the comparisons are unfair comparisons. So another area that I'm really passionate about is medication management in aged care. So it's a really key quality and safety issue. It's um, a third of all the issues that were raised with the Royal Commission related to poor medication management. And it is the greatest source of complaint to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, which is a separate body. Um, and so what, what can these information systems potentially tell us about the medications that residents are on? When, um, just before I, I was asked to present to the Royal Commission, and you have a lot of discussions with the barristers and, and council beforehand, because they're really trying to get their heads around it. And they said to me, can you just explain how medication management occurs in residential aged care? Just draw us a little diagram. And so, you know, this is sort of, <laughs> it is not, people really forget or don't know how complex medication management is in residential aged care. It's very different from hospitals. In hospitals, you have a doctor who's there on the ground who might prescribe. You have a nurse who's there on the ground who will administer. You have a pharmacy there who's going to review what's happening and dispensing. In aged care, you have a whole range of GPs that are located outside the aged care facility. You have community pharmacies. There may be several that are providing the medications to that aged care, um, aged care facility. You have maybe one RN per facility, and then you have care workers. I mean, it's just a bit of a nightmare. And you have a combination of paper. Doctors are writing orders on paper scripts. Um, and then that information has to get to the community pharmacy and then has to come back to the facility. And then you get phone orders and then that has to be documented. So there are lots of opportunities where errors um, can occur. So one of the really useful things that um, technology can do is it can help this information exchange process. And we've seen a great increase in the use of what are called electronic medication administration record systems. Now, these are not prescribing systems. These are once a GP has written an order, that order gets entered into an administration system. It does have great benefits in terms of improved efficiency when you are um, administering medications, and it can also send some alerts. So you can actually flag residents who may have um, had their dose omitted for a couple of days, and you can also document why that was. So it, and the systems then allow you to produce some reports about that. So it can be really helpful in those sort of day-to-day -day operations. But really, one of the biggest benefits is that suddenly we have electronic data about all the medications that are administered to these people across facilities. And no one is really taking any advantage of this data. So we wanted to get in and demonstrate to providers how they could use their own data to help them with their quality activities. So we worked with a uh, provider who had 70 um, residential aged care facilities, all who'd implemented this system. 
and we extracted their medication administration data. So we could tell them, you know, 98% of your residents are on one or more medication, which obviously is not a great surprise, but 40% of them are on hyper polypharmacy, 21% uh, of them are on antipsychotics. Then we can play with that data. So we can actually say, okay, well, what's the polypharmacy rate by different age groups? Because one of the biggest interventions in residential aged care is to try to look at de-prescribing so that people in their 90s really shouldn't probably have to be taking medications which are preventing them from getting various things into the future. But if you look at this distribution, you'd say, hmm, not much de-prescribing going on in our 695-year-olds who are still sort of on quite high volumes of medications. You can look at use of um, medications by individual facilities. So this is unadjusted data. This is proportion of residents on antipsychotics across 70 facilities. Once again, you could see enormous variation. First question you'd ask is, okay, well, what's the mix of clients at those facilities would need to adjust for that? And then we can do that. And once you adjust for some of those um, resident factors, you might be thinking, okay, look at those red dots up there. They might be facilities that you might want to start thinking about, well, what are the GPs doing in that area? What are the facilities doing? But it gives you somewhere to focus upon. The other core thing with medications is you can't look at them in isolation. You've got to look at them relative to the types of conditions people have. And in residential aged care, <laughs> It's quite amazing how little information we have about what types of conditions people actually have. Because the main source of information that people rely upon are what's called the, the ACFI records. And that is the information that facilities use in order to get funding. And so you record a certain number of conditions and you get to a point where it doesn't really matter if you add any more conditions because you're not going to get any more funding. So you can imagine it's not a really good comprehensive view of all the conditions clients have. So one of the things we've done is have a look at, there are other parts of the client's records where they actually record other conditions because they're the conditions that are being managed every day. And we've developed an algorithm using natural language processing where we can extract those conditions and bring them together to get a more comprehensive view of what are the types of conditions people actually have in aged care. And um, most recently, <clears throat> me, we've applied that to a large data set um, and are able to look at sort of uh, prevalence of the most common conditions. Anybody like to take a guess at the most common condition in residential aged care in Australia? Arthritis, that's close. Diabetes, no. On the list, though, any other brave soul? Okay, constipation. Constipation is the major condition, but it's actually been really underrepresented because, you know, it's not going to influence the funding. Um, but it is really prevalent and uh, led to headlines like this <laughs> after the, the paper was uh, released. So we can now, if we can start getting a much more accurate picture of people's conditions, we can link that to their medication use to start looking at appropriateness of medications. So for example, while the government wants to introduce a national indicator of proportion of residents on antipsychotics, that in itself is not that helpful unless you can say proportion of people on antipsychotics with certain types of conditions, because then that you can start having conversations with clinicians about is that appropriate or not. And so here's some examples of where we've brought that information together, looking at people's conditions and their use of um, antipsychotics. The other fantastic thing about this data is you actually have duration. So you know when they started the medication and how long they've been on it, which we've never had before. And so looking at um, across the 70 facilities we had, we could find that the mean duration someone was on an antipsychotic was 190 days, and the guidelines state it should be less than three months. And then for people with dementia, um, the majority of them had it, or 65% um, of them had been on it for over three months. So it starts to really giving you some meaningful data whereby you can start tackling what the issues are. 
You can also start looking at under use of certain medications. So you can start saying, okay, here we looked at people who had osteoporosis, and then what proportion of them were on different types of medications to get a sense of are people perhaps missing out on important medications that they should be on. So it's not just about overuse. And antibiotics, which we're obviously very concerned about because overuse has bad effects for residents, but it also increases antibiotic resistance. Um, so there was a national audit. They do snapshot audits, which showed that 63% of residents were on a course of antibiotics, and they estimated that only around 18% were consistent with guidelines. And so we looked across our 68 facilities, and you can see the enormous variation in um, rates of use. So that, that's fantastic. That's really giving us descriptive data which allows organisations potentially to take action. But we want to move beyond that as well and to start moving from descriptions to actually predicting what, um, when residents might be declining and then providing some actual decision support as well. So we have a new um, NHMRC grant, which we're in our first, we've just finished our first year. And the aim here is to really build on this work to say, can we establish a dashboard for residential aged care, which is predictive and has some decision support. And we're gonna focus on two outcome areas, falls and uh, quality of life. So this is sort of a conceptual idea. We're not building an entire clinical information system. What we wanna do is work with the clinical information systems that are currently in a, uh, aged care uh, and see if we can build back-end algorithms. Um, and so let me give you the examples of falls. So when a resident comes in, they'll often have a falls assessment, you know, a whole series of assessments. But that is a static document. That's their falls risk at that point in time. And unless you're gonna do that every day, it's not that useful. And most often it might be done every six months or maybe every year. Residents are having their medications changed, not infrequently. And some medications really put you at increased risk of falls. So what we are hoping to do is to build an algorithm at the back, which links the client's medication data and then indicates, oh, look, they've changed their medications. That's going to increase their falls. And you have an indicator on the screen which indicates that their falls risk has in increased. So it's dynamic. Um, and it can be responded to in that way. It doesn't require somebody to do an individual false assessment. It's automatically triggered by other variables that are known about the resident. Well-being is much more tricky, but we also we have this view that there are when you talk to aged care workers, they know when residents start going down here or things aren't going well, and there are some indicators. So it may well be that they increase their pain their you know, PRN pain medication. They may be decreasing the number of times they engage in social activities within the facility. So what we're trying to think about with this model is can we build those variables in to use them to then also trigger um, the fact that the client may be not doing so well and needs attention. So it's really this idea of bringing information together to have a holistic view that triggers somebody to do something. And very briefly, we've got three stages. One is doing all the data work, doing all the data linkage, building the algorithms. The next step is then saying, okay, it's all very nice having this dashboard, but how does it actually integrate into everyday work? Who's looking at it? Who has the power to make a decision? Who do you target the decision support at? So we're doing a lot of direct observational work with the care workers, with the clients as well. So interviews with clients about what information do they want? Etc. And then the final step, of course, because it's an HMRC, we're doing a step wedge randomized control trial to see whether it actually improves the outcomes that we're interested in. So, finally, I wanted to talk about um, community care as well. So, I spent a lot of time about residential aged care, but really, for most Australians, they want to stay in their own homes, they want to age in their own homes. And we have much less research about what's happening in community care or the outcomes. 
So in some earlier work, when we were working with aged care providers, they often, the larger providers provide residential care, but they also provide um, aged care services to people in the community. And they have information systems about those clients as well, but they're even less developed. But we wanted to see whether we could start looking at that data to find out questions about, well, what's the, what's the value? Are these services actually producing better outcomes? So we, we looked at this data. Uh, you can see that it's all sort of, you know, the different tables, siloed, takes an enormous amount of work, but we got through all that. Um, and we sort of had questions about, well, what types of services are being used? Is there a difference between needs and services delivered? So often people will get assessed and they say, oh, you know, I need help with shopping, I need personal care, but then what they actually get may be very different. So here's some examples of some of the, the sort of broad descriptive data that you can start looking at, uh, but it can be really useful also to look at things like the proportion of clients that have language other than English. So there's almost 30% of these clients, because that also will, should influence how you uh, provide your services. We can look at the different types of services by where are these being delivered. So you can see that for people in the outer regional areas, they had a much higher proportion of nursing services, respite and home maintenance services. And then people in the metropolitan areas had a higher proportion of shopping and meal preparation. What are um, clients' needs? These are the things that they say they need. So for outer regional uh, clients, it's bathing, dressing, and toileting, so personal care needs. Uh, and for, um, you can see the differences in people in the city are slightly more walking and uh, what is getting out of bed. Uh, was a higher one there. What's the gap between needs and services? So here you can see there were 770 clients who said that they needed help with personal care. In the city, 58% of them received those services. In the country, 47%. Uh, for shopping, 284 people said they needed it, 30% got it in the city and 18% in the outer regional areas. So there's a big gap, but it's really important that we start producing this data to highlight these gaps. A really important thing, question at the end of the day is, if you provide these services, does it actually work to keep people in their homes for longer? And there's really very little evidence about this internationally. And this is great work led by uh, Michaela Jorgensen in our team where she looked at over a thousand clients who were receiving um, care in the services in the community. And after a year, about 20% of people move into residential aged care. Uh, but what she showed is that for each hour of service per week they received, it was associated with a 6% lower risk of entry into residential aged care. So the more services people got in the community, it did significantly reduce the chance that they would be um, admitted to permanent care. So it's some of the strongest evidence we have to date that it really is worthwhile investing in community care services. And it's what people want. The last thing is this, you know, really difficult area of, you know, well-being, quality of life, social participation, because at the end of the day, that's probably the most important outcome indicator in aged care, even though everyone's sort of fixated on all the clinical assessments and activities of daily living. Um, so in one study, we've done some work here to look at trying to build in assessments of quality of life and social participation for community care clients. Uh, and this was some work that also uh, Joyce Siet has been very involved in. And the idea is we worked with an aged care provider and we said, we want you to, you know, they were interested in measuring these things, but we don't want to do it just as a research project. We want you actually to build these assessments into your clinical information system so that they are permanently there. And they agreed to do that. And so um, this is one example of the, the tool. So this is the Australian Community Participation Questionnaire. It's 15 questions asking you about things like um, your, uh, how active are you in, in current affairs? So I talk about current affairs with others quite often, rarely, very often, et cetera. It's an, actually an Australian-based survey. 
tool. And we also looked at the ice cap O, which is quality of life scale. It only has five questions. Um, and it's based on um, questions such as love and friendship. And the scale is I have all the love and friendship that I want down to I cannot have any of the love and friendship that I want. And we were really interested to see how the community care workers would um, feel about administering these with their clients, which they tended to do on a face-to-face -face basis, and also how the clients would feel about answering these types of questions. Uh, and these are just some of the, the comments that we got back. Um, so one of the care workers said, the thing I did learn from, from one lady was that she was quite happy being socially isolated. And I think that's really important that we don't have this view that everyone has to be really connected and things, that there is an enormous variation. Uh, some of the care workers beforehand said, you know, oh, yeah, we think this is a good thing. But I know one of them said to me, look, is that I've had known this client for five years. You know, I don't think I'm going to learn anything new. And as a researcher, it was really quite a nice to, she came back and she said, I had no idea that she was, you know, so lonely, that she'd had all these problems because we never have any questions that ask about these things. It's all about activities of daily living or about a particular service. Uh, and it really won the care workers over to the extent that they kept pushing to have it rolled out further and, and faster. So even though we were trying to run a trial, we kept finding these surveys turning up from um, other, other um, outlets who were using it. Some of the other quotes, um, it opened up a huge amount of sadness, you know, that she started opening up to me about all sorts of things that she wouldn't think I have opened up about unless um, we'd done the survey. Um, and so it's all very good to say, yeah, we need to get them out in the community, but there might be barriers and there are stepping stones to working out what those barriers are. And that was, I think, one of the challenges, the feedbacks we, we came up with is that it does raise a lot of problems that aren't easily solvable. Um, you know, they don't have the level of services that can always address the needs that are identified in these conversations. But from the client's perspective, what we also found was that they were just happy that someone had asked them about these things. They didn't necessarily need everything to be solved for them, but that someone was asking them about how they were going in their life, what was important to them, et cetera. Um, they valued. And you can also see just on the side is the care workers came up with some really interesting different types of scales. They were finding some of their clients were finding it difficult to work out what, you know, I can get as much as I want or as little as I want. So they came up with all these different scales. It's, it's really interesting. And it's probably been, you know, something that's really been rewarding as a researcher to be involved in. They also came back to us and said, look, you know, but we've got all these clients who can't speak English and they're missing out. So we ended up then having it translated into Turkish, Korean and Mandarin, which in itself was quite, quite a major feat as well. But I think it shows you how valuable they thought it was to do that. We then brought many of the clients together with the aged care providers for a couple of um, community forums um, where they could talk about their experiences of having participated in the research. And, um, you know, I'm sure you probably do this quite regularly, but it is really rewarding to, to have those interchanges and and one of the women there in the back row, you know, she got up at five o'clock to come to Macquarie and she told all the children about it and they rang her up on the morning say, oh, mum, you're off to university. And she said, I've been in the country for 35 years and I've never been in a university in my entire life. And, you know, and we get them a certificate at the end of it. And so, you know, I think we forget sometimes how just participating can be incredibly uh, rewarding for people. And it was also good because we got the Commonwealth Department of Health person who's in charge of the DAX program to be there as well. And, you know, she said, you know, it's the first time that she actually had any interaction with people who, you know, she was um, controlling the program for. So really, really a lot of work, but really worthwhile. So really in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you that information technology is not really boring, but incredibly powerful tool. Um, and importantly, it's something that we can do now. It's a very pragmatic approach because we know the aged care system requires a major overhaul. I think we're also realistic to think that's not going to happen anytime um, soon. I think um, what is also very uh, important is that we don't try to impose an acute care model 
into the aged care sector, which is a great temptation. And we've also seen the same thing with the clinical information systems. The design has often come out of an acute care setting and, oh, we'll just tweak it a bit for aged care, but it is very different and we can't use that approach. And of course, it must involve um, the residents, clients, consumers and families because it is all about them at the end of the day. So thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to talk with you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Stand, I'm just going to step in here so you can be seen and then, yeah, don't run away. Um, thank you, Joanna, for a fantastic presentation. Um, as you can see, she's absolutely inspiring and a real exemplar of Macquarie's world-changing impact, the work that you do. So as you can see, she's a superstar. I don't think she sleeps. 450 publications, $50 million or more in research funding. This year awarded the uh, Elizabeth Blackburn NHMRC Investigator uh, Fellowship, particularly for her research in health sciences uh, research. Lots of overlap, I think, with the work that we do in our centre, and we hope to be doing a lot more work with you, Joanna, and your team. Um, so thank you for that. But we do have some questions, hopefully, for you. So if we can um, have questions, and then I will repeat them for our live audience. Can our live audience put them in the chat column? No. I think we can actually receive questions from the live audience if you pop it into a chat. You can try and we'll, and we'll do our best and see if we can read them for you. Yeah. yeah, so the virtual online audience can just put their questions in the uh, chat function. All right, so anyone here have any questions for Joanna? Here we are, we have peers. I don't know if it's peers one or peers two. I'm going with peers one. What's your question? So we just need to repeat the question first, if that's okay, Joanna. Okay. So do you want so to have a go at that or do you yeah. want me to repeat oh, it? Sorry. So um, basically the question was, can, how confident can we be about the quality of the data that's going into these clinical information systems if we're going to use them? Because there's under-reporting of things like hearing and vision and other things. <coughs> so, yeah, a absolutely. So I suppose... Um, I think the key thing is that these are the systems and the information that is used every day to manage clients. Um, and so that's, in a sense, that's better than the sort of audit data, which is a one-off, you know, which people, are, a whole range of people are doing. They might be applying um, slightly different definitions, collecting the data in different ways. They don't really care about what the outcome is because it takes them so long before they get any results back. So I think that's the problem. So I think it's better than the one-off audit. Absolutely, this is um, a problem that's not unique to aged care, it's also in the acute care sector, is what is the quality of the data going in? What we know is that once you start using data from a system and reporting it back, that's usually when the quality starts to improve because people see that it's being useful and they're getting feedback about it. Um, it doesn't mean that necessarily the quality of the care improves automatically, so the fact that people would then suddenly say, oh, we've, you know, we should test Maybe we should test hearing more uh, frequently, but it might if you report back that, you know, 1% of people over 90 have a hearing loss in aged care, it might, you know, spark a thing saying maybe we're under, you know, investigating this issue when we should possibly um, do something about it. So one hopes that it's a bit of a push to improve things, but absolutely we can't be 100% confident that the quality is going to be fantastic. I have a question for you, Joanna. Do I have to be on video? I don't know. <clears throat> there you are. I have a question for you, Joanna. Um, and that is that the, obviously the dashboard is a fantastic idea for being able to collect this data and collect it routinely, not relying on paper copies. How transferable is that data system? So I, I don't know, but I imagine 
that many of the uh, residential aged care facilities, lots of the aged care services have their own internal systems and programs that they use. And so I think this is often one of the problems we have with translation is that you can design something for one organization, which is fantastic, but then it's not compatible with all the other services. Absolutely. And as I said, we're not in the business of building a clinical information system for aged care. What we want to do is build generic algorithms that could be incorporated into a range of different residential aged care facility systems. So there are some sort of core groups. There are some systems that probably, you know, depends who you talk to, but 30 or 40% of the market. So we're sort of working with some of those bigger systems. Um, but it really is this idea of coming up with generic algorithms, identifying what are the things that should be in those algorithms, which then should be built into any aged care system. And it's also really about putting pressure on the IT vendors in this space, because they basically are not under any pressure, because the amount of expertise in health informatics in the sector is really minimal. And so what providers tend to do is they are sold systems, um, and often perhaps they don't know, uh, you know the limitations of the systems and they're not being pushed to say, actually, what I would really like is I'd like to be able to report every you know, month, have these sort of uh, reports produced from my data. I want some sort of adjustment done for these variables, et cetera. So the systems have virtually no reporting capability at the moment. So this is all about demonstrating it's possible uh, so they can't say, oh, no, it's all too difficult. And then putting pressure on them saying, this is what clients want. And that's why it's so important that we work with providers to say, this is what you should be asking for. We've shown it's possible to do even with your current systems. When you get your new upgrade, this is what you should be pushing for. But in addition, it's going to place like the Royal Commission and saying, this is what it should look like. Um, so there is a big gap. I mean, there's still some facilities that are totally paper-based. But one hopes that in the next, you know, five to 10 years, they will have systems available to them that are much better than the current systems. So it's, you know, incremental process. And of course, that really builds accountability, right? For like services and um, in improving the access and the, just the well-being um, of residents. There's something I was gonna ask you, but it's actually gone from my mind. Um, the other thing is say this is not just about um, providing information to the providers, but what we want to do with the, the dashboard is look at a view for clients as well. So, for example, just to be able to produce a report for the family or for the client themselves that these are the medications you're on and flag, by the way, you've been on this antipsychotic, recommended guidelines are you should only be on it for three months. You might want to have a conversation with your GP. So giving them enough information which allows them to go and go and take some action, which at the moment they don't, you know, it's really a bit hit and miss. So we're also doing that. We've done, um, the team's done about 30 interviews with community care clients saying, what do you want in a dashboard? What is the information that you would like? Uh, I mean, information is uh, knowledge, isn't it? Just having this information. And I just, I mean, I'm shocked. You're probably not shocked even though I've heard you do this talk before, um, but just about the lack of data and some of the things that they don't even know about the residents or people, like just like the, the, the lack of information that's actually recorded and reported is just um, really scary, I guess. Is there anything that still surprises you when you go in and look at some of these, this stuff? Is this, do you still ever get the, you're, at, you're kidding me <laughs> response? I mean, I think, there are some fantastic people in, in the aged care sector who are doing a really good job. And I think it's really hard for them because they're just constantly getting this bashed over head about the problems. And I, so I, I think we mustn't forget that there are really good people there that are working under incredibly difficult constraints. The workforce, you know, it's just like we're used to working in the, in the acute care sector where you have a cadre of specialists and researchers. And, you know, if you have a problem, you just ring up the IT department and you can get an answer. You know, aged care just don't have that. I mean, they're lucky they have one RN, you know, there during the day. So I think we've got to really remember um, the constraints that they're working under. And I suppose it really came home to me about the, perhaps the limited clinical expertise is, you know, we're all going in and we have COVID temperature te checks when you go into a residential aged care facility. And I go and visit my mum who's in one. And so I had my temperature checked and it came out as, you know, 34.2 and um, 
you know, I looked up at the, the care worker and I said, oh, you know. And she said, oh, yes, everyone's been low today. And then we all happily went on our way. So I just, you know, think yeah, they, 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 it is challenging. <laughs> all right, does anyone else have any questions at this point? Is it, no? Maybe I have one last question for you, just because I've got the microphone. <laughs> Psychologists, we often like to ask when we talk to children about their goals for therapy, we often have this analogy. We talk about using a magic wand. And I normally say, if I had a magic wand, which I don't have, but just imagine I did have a magic wand and I could grant you three wishes. What would be your three wishes? So I would like to know, Joanna, if I had a magic wand and could do something in aged care, that you could do, that I could help you with. I'm not actually saying me. I'm not taking any responsibility for this. This is a magic wand question. What are your three wishes? What are the three things that need to change? What are the three things you'd like to do? Um, yeah. I mean, if this is a fantasy question, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think we just totally have a, the wrong model of aged care. Totally. I mean, I think even if you look in... They're getting closer to it in sort of um, European countries. It's just a total, we, we just, we've institutional, we've set up an institutional model of aged care, which is completely wrong, which people don't really want. And it takes away people's independence. And, um, you know, so that's, you know, I, I think if we, you know, if we put back the world and start from scratch, we would design a totally different system. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's really difficult to go back from where we are. Um, so what we're, we're left with is trying to, um, in some ways, sort of band-aid the current system. And I think we can do a lot of things which would make it a lot better. But I'm just hoping that we also look at really revolutionising and thinking of totally different models. Because, you know, every survey you ask people about what they want to do is they want to be, you know, in a, in a real home life environment. Um, and at the moment, you know, it's still very a very sort of patronising system. Um, I mean, during COVID, you know, they were <laughs> another example. You know, the aged care facility said, "Oh, you know, this is we couldn't go and visit," and so we've set up the window of happiness, you know, which is where you could look through. Now that was just like, it, you know, <laughs> it, it's 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 you might treat children in that way but you know to think if you're an adult and you're sort of going I've got a window of happiness so you know it, it's difficult because the population is has very different needs and there are very high needs people um, but my fantasy would be a totally different view of, of aged care that doesn't look like a healthcare delivery system well, Joanna, there you go. That's a really good wish. You're probably the one to actually make the changes to the world. So there you go. There's your, your next challenge. All right, any other final questions before?